Reason and reason, reasonableness. Chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a very long chapter. So instead of reading the entire 36th verse, we're going to read from 1 through 6 and then 19 through 36. It's still a very long chapter. But let's start. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and people of every language who live in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are His signs, how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. And all the wise men of Babylon he brought before me to interpret the dream for me. Verse 19. Then Daniel, also called Bethesda, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning harm you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries, the tree you saw which grew large and strong, with all top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your Majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump, bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation. Oh. <laughs> and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone He wishes. He commands to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, Your Majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that when your prosperity will continue, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence? by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, 
a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, he was driven away from people and ate grass like the rocks. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the people of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now, 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 <laughs> now, okay, listen to that. <laughs> That was a long story. Wow. I think I could just pray and end the message right there. <laughs> so, this chapter that we just read is a bit different from most of the scriptures in the Bible. This chapter that we read is kind of different. Have you noticed what the difference was? I'll tell you. It is a story of who? Yes, it is a story of King Nebuchadnezzar, but it's told in the first person. Let's go back. Can you put up verse 4? <clears throat> oh, well, let's go up to verse 1. Let's start with verse 1. Okay. Okay. So it's King Nebuchadnezzar to the nations and people of every uh, language. Okay, so he's declaring, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. So he's telling everybody, hey, it's my pleasure to tell you my story. Right? This is kind of weird. He's saying, it's from the first person. I think somebody's going to take care of it. Let's go to verse 4 now. It says what? Uh, verse 4. Are we at verse 4? Uh, chapter 4, verse... Uh, verse 4. I never will read right here. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home. So, again, he's talking about it as a first person. I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is what happened to me. Okay, let's read verse 34. At, at the end of that time, again, I, Nebuchadnezzar. So this is story of Nebuchadnezzar told by himself. It's a first person. It ends in verse 37. So if you go to verse 36, I think we can see the top of verse 36. I, now, I, Nebuchadnezzar. So this book is kind of different. Instead of this book, being told by Daniel, oh, you know what? There, there is this king, Nebuchadnezzar, and this is what happened to him. Instead of a story being told this way, all of a sudden, there's one chapter in the book of Daniel that is, almost sounds like it was written by King Nebuchadnezzar. You understand? So, this chapter was either written by 
the king himself, or probably Daniel wrote it, but what the king proclaimed was so important, he basically took the king's language. And he told this chapter as if the king was telling it, as he heard the king tell it. First person of Nebuchadnezzar. So, what was so special about this chapter that Daniel chose to write this in the first person of King Nebuchadnezzar? As if he was telling the story. This chapter had great importance for King Nebuchadnezzar. King, at the beginning of chapter 4, is telling all the nations, you know what? I, this miraculous thing happened to me, and I want to tell it to the whole earth. This is so important, I'm going to tell you exactly from my lips. King wanted to memorialize an experience of an utmost importance that forever changed his life. that forever changed his life. After this chapter, we don't hear about King Nebuchadnezzar anymore. Because this was such a profound experience for him. His life changed forever after that. And he never went wishy-washy again. If you, read, if you remember Daniel 1, 2, 3, you could see King Nebuchadnezzar kind of going back and forth, back and forth. He first praises the God of Daniel. And then he builds an image for himself and says, worship me. And those people that he's worshiping the God that he said was most high God, he wanted to throw him into the furnace. So he never connects up to this point, was wishy-washy about God and himself. He was humble and he was proud and he was humble and proud. Now, this is a life-changing experience for King Nebuchadnezzar. Where at the end of this, this chapter, we don't hear about King Nebuchadnezzar anymore. Because he stopped going back and forth, wishy-washy. Like our life. We go wishy-washy on God many times. But this experience made the king stop. And I can forever, I'm not changing. So, what was this eternal, eternal life-changing experience? This ultimate realization. Verse 37, it's not here because I put the verses wrong. 37 says this, Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven. For all his works are right, and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Now I'm going to deconstruct this. I'm going to deconstruct this phrase. Listen very carefully. Okay. I, King Nebuchadnezzar, praise, extort, honor, glorify the King of Heaven. For... All his works are right, and all his ways are just. Basically, God is right and just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. He's powerful. He's right, he's just, and he's powerful. If you are proud, he has the power to humble you. Against your will, basically. That's what he's proclaiming at the end of the chapter, the very last verse. To me, there seems to be two life-changing experiences that he wants to proclaim to everyone, all nations. The first is that God of Daniel, God of Israelites, is not only a powerful God, but He is perfect God. He came to realization. You know, Daniel's going to hate me, but Daniel's reading this Greek mythology books. You know, Zeus, Apollo, Jupiter, and all these things. 
and he's he's on our way over. He's like, Dad, did you know that Kronos was a god and he killed some other god, and then Aphrodite came. I mean, he was telling me all these things, and when I hear these things, it's like the mythology Greek gods were like humans. They had lust. They had greed. They have they had spiritual issues, you know, they killed people, you know, they killed each other. You know, it's, it's as if all these gods, that all these idols, that all these non-Christians worship, they were these kind of gods. It was like people with power. You know, it's like Avengers. You know, if you, you're a regular person, but you had power, now you're a god. You're Thor. Everybody worshiped you. But, you know, if you look at the what watch the movie Thor. He has some issues in his lifetime too. So this is how they viewed God. But God of Israelites, God of Daniel is different. He was perfect God. He's not only right all the time, but he's just. Okay. So first thing King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to tell everybody is, you know, this God of Daniel is perfect God. Second thing is this. That under such God, everyone must be humble. Under that kind of a God who's right, who's just, who's perfect, and who's powerful, who could take the proud person and make that person humble, you must be humble. That even the greatest king of that kind, namely myself, King Nebuchadnezzar, even I have to humble myself before God. Okay, These two points... It's what King Nebuchadnezzar is trying to tell the whole world. So, is this the God that you also believe in? CJ, God that you believe in, is He right? He's just, He's perfect and He's powerful? And you have to be humble? So the question after that is, then are you actually humble? Are you really humble? What does it mean to be humble? Or more practically, how do we humble ourselves before our God? Now, today, this message is kind of, you have to listen very carefully because I'm going to approach this in a very different way. What's the title of my sermon, sermon today? Okay, everybody. One, two, three. Okay. Your humbleness is linked to reason and reasonableness. Okay? Humbleness is going to be linked to reason and reasonableness. You know, what was what was the thing what was the thing that God took away from the king when he was proud and returned when he became humble? We read 30 some verses. It says when Nebuchadnezzar took something away from the king when he was humble and he became like an animal, right? He 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 was on all fours he had no... Oh, I almost gave the, word, the answer. What was the thing that God took away from the king when he became proud? Anybody? Even the teachers? Anybody? His kingdom. Okay, how? But he lost something. Sanity. Okay, sanity. <clears throat> Verse 34 and 36 says this. Is, My reason returned to me. So, when he became proud... What did God took away from King Nebuchadnezzar? His? His reason. God took away his ability to what? Think like a human being. Now, what happened when reason was taken away from King Nebuchadnezzar? What happened to him? He became like a what? Huh? Huh? Animal. So, Teacher jumps here, and if we take away his reason and his sanity, he's going to become like what? 
He's going to be like an animal, right? <clears throat> what the King Nebuchadnezzar desperately wanted to claim, proclaim to everyone at the time, he says, hey, reason is given to you by God. Your ability to what? Think. To reason things. Hey, is this reasonable? Is this not reasonable? Is it reasonable that 1 plus 1 is 187? God gave you this reason, ability to reason. But He gave it to you so you could use that reasoning to praise God, to glorify God, and to honor God. Okay? He also is warning the generation that if you are not worshiping God, if you are not praising God, if you're not glorifying God, if you're not honoring God, it's like you are without reason. Understand? What the king is saying is this, okay, I was proud and when I was proud, God took away my reason and I became like an animal. I ate the grass. For seven years, she ate. He was like a cow, basically. He didn't have a home. He's running around the, the field. He's sleeping on the dew. And he gets up, and he's just living like an animal. When he became humble, reason returned to him, and he praised God. He glorified, he honored God. Okay. Are you a reasonable person? How many of you, I actually want to see hands, think you are, I am a reasonable person? <laughs> Nobody's reasonable here? Okay, thank you, my wife. <laughs> She's a very reasonable person. James, are you a reasonable person? I think so. Daniel, are you a reasonable person? You know, everybody in here is going to say, Rebecca, you're reasonable, right? No, you're not reasonable? <laughs> Jim is about to that, yeah, she's not reasonable. <laughs> Most of us sitting here say that we are reasonable. So, what does it mean to be reasonable? How come you're thinking of yourself as, I'm a reasonable person? You know, when somebody's talking, I hear this, man, you're not being reasonable. You're asking for too much. Hey, that's not reasonable. Basically, you're not thinking straight. That's what I'm trying to tell the other person. The logic you have is not right. You're not being reasonable. Come on. You're going to raise my rent by 200%. That's not reasonable. You know, I got this for, for you last time. You want me to get it again? That's unreasonable. What are you telling me? How do we determine reasonable is... You take a situation and you compare it to a standard. There's a standard that you're comparing this to, and you make a determination that this is the right thing, and I'm doing the right thing. I'm thinking the right way. That's why I am reasonable. Understand? If somebody knows right and wrong, and he's just continuously doing the wrong stuff, I know it's not right to beat up somebody just because I don't like that person. But he continues to just beat up everybody. Is he a reasonable person? Maybe to himself, yeah, but to everybody else, no. To be reasonable, you have to compare yourself to a standard something. Of right and wrong. And you have to look at your action to see what it is. Now, for all of the Christians, what are our standards? What do we compare ourselves to see if what we're doing is reasonable or not? What is our standard? You, what's our standard? What do we compare all of our actions, our thinking, to? Is it God or is it the Bible? Okay, the Bible. <laughs> okay, to God. I mean, yeah, it's God. To God. And God gave us those standards in, in a written form, right? Here it is. There's no Bible laying around. Anyways, <laughs> as Christians, the standard that we use to see if we're reasonable or not is the Bible. A lot of the times, you guys, us, me, confuse the standard of the Bible versus the standard of the world. 
Sometimes, you know, what we think about is common sense. If you think about it, you know, those things, hey, everybody knows that stuff. Sometimes if you think about it, that's actually the standard of the world. That's not standard of God. That's not in the Bible. Let me, uh, let me give you an example. When we looked at Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This is the first beginning of Daniel, okay? Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says this, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Okay? Kingdom of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar, goes there with army of people. I mean, overwhelming army. And he besieged it. And he says what? The Lord gave Judah to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now when people read this, a lot of people say, this is nonsense. God doesn't have to give it to him. Why? Because King Nebuchadnezzar could just take it. Judah, let's say there's 10,000 people. Let's just say. Let's say King Nebuchadnezzar came there with a million people. And said, you know what? God's going to give you, give King Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom of Judah. People say, that's stupid. He doesn't need God's permission. All you have to do is what? Hey, go get it. And his million soldiers will go in there and just wipe out that, 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 that city, right? Our common sense tells us that since King Nebuchadnezzar had all this army, overwhelming army, and kingdom of Judah only has few, it's really not reasonable to say God gave it to him. I mean, it's, he doesn't have to give it to him. It's just common sense he could take it. Now, Daniel would have something to write about if it was the other way around. If he came with a million people and said, God gave king of Judah... King Nebuchadnezzar. 10,000 people, one, a million soldiers. If that was the case, we would say, yes, Lord gave it to him because that was the impossible thing, right? So, a lot of times when we think of reason and reasonableness, we think about as in a worldly standard. One million versus 10,000. Okay, it's this thing, eating this thing is obvious thing. It's a common sense. God doesn't have to do anything. He could just be silent. It's going to happen anyway. Now, if this would have happened, then God worked a miracle. That's our common sense. But, what happened here? In, in chapter 4, it demonstrates that God can do whatever, whenever, even if it's obvious. Because King Nebuchadnezzar said it with his own mouth. He would... He, for the proud, he has the power to humble you whenever, where, however he wants. What King Nebuchadnezzar realized is before he thought he won all these things with his power. I have an army of a million. Who's going to stop me? What did he say to the three friends of Daniel when they were saying, you know, God's going to save us? Thing? Who's going to save you from my hand? But King Nebuchadnezzar, he thought like every one of us. He used common sense. What looks possible is possible. What looks impossible is impossible. <coughs> and then what he learned here is this. Even that obvious thing happened just because God allowed it to happen. He realized that. The thing that you look at something and say, hey, that's a coincidence. Something happened in your life. Something happened to your life, and you say, that's a coincidence. Even if God doesn't have to work in my life, it would have happened to me anyways. I don't need God to explain that. Those things, what King Nebuchadnezzar is saying is this, even those are allowed by God. If God wants to, He could at any time turn that around, 
the great king. One minute he was proud. He said, look at all these things that I got. You know, he's like an animal. He's running around with all four eating grass. What's wrong with the king? What's wrong with their great king? God is able to snap of, a, of his finger, just turn everything around. For all Christians, all reasonableness, all reason must start, start from God. And it ends with God. For all who are sitting here, I want to encourage you to not only see the visible, natural things of the earth, of the world, but the invisible, supernatural causes from God. Everything is possible because God allows it. God has the power to do whatever, whenever. He is able to take any proud person and make that person humble. He has that ability. He has that power. As I close, I want to remind you that when King Nebuchadnezzar disregarded God, his reason left him, right? We all understand this now, right? His reason left him. When we do not acknowledge God as God, when you guys, when people out on the earth, if we don't acknowledge God as God, we live as if our reasoning has left us and we become like beasts. What's the difference between man and an animal? What's the difference? Jesse, what's the difference between a man and an animal? Men are usually more intelligent than men. Yeah. Uh, one of the professor at physics professor said, you know, and he was saying, you know, how evolution was ludicrous. You know, he said, we write poems. We see the beauty in music. We write plays. There's Shakespeare. Animals don't do that. You know, and, and he wasn't a Christian. He was just kind of telling us what he was observing. Right? Animal doesn't think about its purpose. Why am I here? Why am I eating? If I'm a fly, why am I sitting on this poop and I'm eating this thing? Why am I doing this right now? If I'm a cockroach, I say, why do I have to live in this darkness? Bugs, animals, things like that. They don't contemplate the meaning of life. Is that morally right to do? For me to go and bite that guy? <laughs> you know, if I'm a mosquito, you know? Is that the right thing for me to do? What's the value of my existence? No. What is the whole purpose of the animal? What, what is on animal's mind? You know, when I see animal's kingdom, you know, I see seals and there's polar bears. You know, first I feel sorry for the seals because they get eaten by the polar bears. And then the next series on the polar bear and I see the mother, if he doesn't catch the seal, the babies are going to die. And I say, okay, catch the seal, please. You know, I, I, I keep going back and forth. What is the main function of an animal? What, what is he concerned with? What Survival. is the animal? Oh? Survival. Survival. More. Okay, animals, when I look at the animal kingdom, they only consider with two things, eating and mating. They live to eat and mate. You know, we, I watched the series with Daniel, this frog thing, you know, it's trying to mate. And it's, you know, it, it's expanding this, this, this thing, and it's making this weird noise, and two males are competing. And then... Daniel's saying, how can anything be attracted by that? You know, that looks <laughs> disgusting. But in the frog kingdom, they think that's a beautiful thing, right? And then, you know, if you're a female frog, you say, that, he looks so much greater because he's got the bigger, uh, bigger <laughs> pouch on his, on, on, he's able to expand his neck over right here, you know? So, animal kingdom is, is interested in what? Eating and mating. There's no contemplation. There's just two. Look around you. Look at the 
people who do not glorify God, but are just full of themselves, what are the things that they are really concerned about? It's about the same thing. Eating and mating. With the greater complexity, of course, but it's the same kind of a thing. I want all of you to live as a complete human being that God has meant for you when He created you in His image. He gave you reason so you could praise Him, you could honor Him, you could glorify Him, you could worship Him. When you don't do those things, reason's going to escape you. You're going to become like the beast, only thinking about eating and mating. Don't become conceited by thinking that you don't need God. Don't become foolish by thinking that everything that you have and everything you will accomplish will come from your own efforts. Don't make the same mistake the King Nebuchadnezzar made. Look at all these things I've done. You know, I'm getting straight A's. Hey, I'm going to need to break college. It's because I studied really hard. At, you know, all these things. Your career, your marriage, God allowed it to happen for you. It's not your own doing. That's why, even in marriage, if you don't give, do your best, you are disobeying God. It's not just for the love of the two people. The relationship has been established through God, and you're honoring God with that also. I want all of you to have faith that see beyond the visible things of the world to the invisible things of, of God, of faith. I want you to see things through the lens of God with His perspective. I want all of you to see beyond your comfort, your satisfaction, your fulfillment, and see the needs of those around you. You know, when you see somebody, it's good, it's, it's easy just to see them as what a grudge person. That guy just has a problem. He's just full of anger. I don't want to talk to that person at all. But when you see everything through God's eyes, when you use God's reasoning, the ability to think in the Spirit of God, you will see them for more than just that. To a person who has pain in their heart, maybe they've suffered in their experience, maybe that those kind of things make them who they are. And you see them through the eyes of God, and you use the reasoning that God gave you, and your reasonable response is not to say, hey, stay away from that person. That's the worldly reasonableness. Biblical reasonableness is, hey, i got to approach that person, and I have to give him the love of God. Understand? Reason and reasonableness, we have to have both things in God. Okay. Let's all bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. You gave us our ability to think. You gave us our reasoning ability to appreciate life, to see the good and the bad, and to judge for ourselves. All of this possible because it came from you. You are the originator of reason. And we measure our reasonableness to the standard of your word. I pray that we will not disregard that, Lord. That, that we will not just, just skip you and just go directly to the common sense that we think. Because all of that is from the world. The survival of the fittest. The economy of capitalism. The stronger rule over the weak. What this world considers common sense is not reasonableness in your sight. When we do not use our reason to glorify you, we will lose our sanity, we will lose our meaning, we will lose our reason, and we will be just like the beast of the field. We will be like the animals, just thinking about those things that are just carnal just physical, 
not spiritual. As King Nebuchadnezzar took this and wanted to proclaim it, as Daniel wrote this in the first person of King Nebuchadnezzar because it was so important to him, I pray that we will just not let this message go, Lord. That we will have reason from you. We will acknowledge that and we will, in every circumstances, don't use our common sense, our reasoning, but we will reflect everything on your word, on your standard, and try, be, and try to be the reasonable person as a Christian. I pray that we would seek your Holy Spirit, and your Holy Spirit will help us. And to seek your Holy Spirit, we have to be connected to the Holy Spirit, and to be connected to the Holy Spirit, we have to do our quiet time. We have to spend time with you. We have to read your word. We have to pray to you, Lord. Help us not to be lazy in these things. I pray that every one of us here will realize the love that you have for us, Lord. That you love us so, so very much, Lord. That you want to provide all these things to us so you can make us happier. Pray that we will let go of ourselves and depend on you. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone say, Amen.